Live from Orlando, Florida, you're listening to the Orlando Magic HQ podcast, the voice of Magic fans. Join us every week for a unique fan perspective on all of the latest Magic news and updates. The show starts now. Welcome back to another episode of the Orlando Magic HQ podcast brought to you by the Believe Podcast Network and Bet Online, where your host, Al, myself, Anthony, today is May 3rd. And tonight, the Orlando Magic will face off against the Cleveland Cavaliers in game six in Orlando. In today's episode, we're gonna we're gonna preview uh well we're gonna touch base on game five because we didn't get a chance to talk about that game, kind of kind of give you our thoughts, and then we'll preview game six. And then talk about some of the uh, the rumor. Where the Magic are in the rumor mill, man. We're still in the playoffs, and they already got certain players being connected to the Orlando Magic. So we're going to touch base on that. But before we get into those topics, uh, what's up, man? How, how how are we feeling going into Game Six? I would just say this, man. It's exciting knowing that it's May third, and we're playing basketball, and hopeful that if we win tonight, there is a Game Seven on Sunday. So. If you would have told me that again back in October, I would have laughed in your face and said, there's no way. Um, we may be a year a year too soon for that, so a year too early. So I'm excited, man. No matter what happens, this is a great, great feeling. Uh, again, to be playing Magic Basketball in May, I'll take it. Dude, it feels, it feels a little weird because like in less than two weeks, you have the lottery that's coming up, which is... Normally something that we have on our calendar that we're counting down the days we're looking forward to. And uh, normally this time span would would drag like crazy. And the fact that the lottery is already right around the corner, we don't we don't care about it. Obviously, you know, it's not going to impact us at all. But um, the fact that we're focusing on on winning playoff games and, and battling against the Cavs in the first round, it, it's been it's been exciting and stressful um all together at the same time so i I really want to talk about game five because i feel like um some things that that went well for the magic and uh other things that that didn't go so well that i really want to discuss but before we get into it quick shout out to our sponsors bet online bet online is your number one source for all your summer sports this season from major league baseball golf nba nhl and playoff stats All the latest stats, news, and scores available to follow your favorite teams. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest team matchups, player props, and odds on just about every sport that's out there. Head to the website today or use mobile device to get in on the action. Bet online where the game starts. And also a quick shout out to our man, Brandon Kravitz from 96.9 The Game. If you're looking for more Orlando sports content, not just the Orlando Magic, but UCF, Orlando City, and any of the top Central Florida sports stories out there. Check out Zoneheads Orlando Podcast. Brandon Kravitz and his crew, they drop about four episodes per week. So make sure you go check that out. Now, Game 5. We, we went into it feeling excited. Excited because we got the news that uh, Jerry Allen was not going to be available, who has been uh, torching us. Uh, this playoff series, a, a big presence that um, has really caused some issues for the Magic um, in, in a majority of the series. So them losing their starting center, you go into it feeling really, really good, right? Because that's that's one last thing that you have to worry about. In my mind, uh, Wendell Carter is going to eat. Jonathan Isaac is going to eat. And in the very beginning of the game, it did feel that way. Wendell Carter had... You know, two two big offensive plays to start the game off. And I really felt like, man, Wendell is going to go off. And I don't know what happened. It it wasn't that was <laughs> that wasn't the case, man. It, if anything, I feel as if it almost kind of threw our guys off because they, they go into it with a game plan of how they're gonna defend Jared Allen because he's definitely a, a huge factor for that team. And to kind of start off with with the positive, right? You you play against Cleveland game one. Uh, you you lose by double digits. Same thing with game two. Um, but the Magic kept this game extremely close, extremely close. It was a back and forth battle. 
Um, it felt like by far the longest game I've watched for the Magic, and it's just because you know I was watching from home, and I don't think I sat down the whole entire time while I was watching this game. It was it was a battle back and forth. Paulo Bancaro goes absolutely insane. Um, we still struggle from from the three point line. Jalen Suggs still, you know, we we don't we're we're not we haven't seen Jalen Suggs like the real Jalen Suggs in Cleveland just yet. Cole Anthony still struggling. Franz Wagner wasn't his dominant self like we saw, you know, in in Game Four. Um, but Paulo Bancaro just just has it rolling, man. He had a really really massive game that he really put us on his back. Um, but Magic could not get it done. Went down to the wire. And I think that that's one of the things that you can really hang your hat on. The fact that, all right, the third game now in the series that we play in Cleveland, every game we're cutting it closer and closer and closer. Like it's, it's, a, it's a closer matchup. So Magic definitely have to win game six to then make it a game seven back in Cleveland. And if I'm being honest with you, I feel a little bit better now playing one more time in Cleveland. And the fact that it kind of feels like we're we're getting it together away because we do struggle for whatever reason in the Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. Um, I do feel a little bit better heading there game seven. But obviously the Magic need to take care of game six first. But what were, what were some of the things that stood out to you for game five? Yeah, man. So I'll start with what you started with. The fact that we found out, hey, Jared Allen is not playing so in my mind, huge advantage, right? That's going to help us rebound even better. Think about this for a second. In game four, we out-rebounded them 43-29. That is with Jared Allen actually playing in that game. So in game five, you would think he's not playing. We got a bigger team. We're going to dominate the boards, right? Not so much. We beat them on the boards 43-39 for a much closer battle. So I was really disappointed in that because I was really hoping that, again, with him not in the lineup, they don't have that many big men. They only really have him, Mobley, and a bunch of guys that play the four that really are not big enough to be to be fives. Um, so that was the number one. Number two, turnovers as well. I think we turned the ball over way too much in Cleveland. We cannot let that happen. We turned the ball over 14 times. And then another big one was another slow start. So we were down 33-23 at the end of the first quarter. And man, the rest of the game was amazing. We were right there with them. But it just makes it that much harder when you have to come back from a double-digit deficit in the first quarter on the road against a team that has a little more experience than you do in the playoffs. So I think those three factors, turnovers, rebounding, and falling in a deficit early on, were the key components to us losing that game. I mean, major shout-out to to Paulo Bencaro. He absolutely killed it. He he was hitting shots that I'm like, who is this guy? Like, he looked like a... Like a shooting guard out there, a T-Mac, a, a young Carmelo Anthony. Like, he was just looking incredible, hitting all types of shots. Um, but, yeah, man, I think those were the key components to me that that led to the loss. Um, and how can I not talk about missed free throws, right? That That's killed us on the road. It killed us again, especially when you think about the fact that we lost by one point and we missed seven free throws. So you make a couple more, and all of a sudden you potentially win that game. Um, so that's really what really kind of impacted me that I said, you know what, if we can clean those things up either in game six or potentially game seven, I like our chances. But again, on the road, you cannot, cannot have the same mistakes keep happening and hoping to have a win. Yeah. I mean, when you look at the free throws, you, we shot 29 to Cleveland's 19. We were 75% from the free throw line. Cleveland was a little bit better at 78, but they only made 15. We made 22. We left. Um, seven points in the game that could have been a huge factor for us, a massive factor. Um, for whatever reason, we, we've just been struggling heavily with our free throw this series, and it's it's been rough. Um, but you're, you're right, man. You, you look at Jared Allen, you look at the strength of our team is the fact that we have so many different big bodies you, there was moments when we had jonathan isaac paulo van carroll franz wagner wendell carter like that's our death lineup um and you you have everywhere you look there's a six foot ten body um in magic blue that that should be out there and just completely dominating the boards and that that's just not what happened it, we were 43 to 39 there cleveland was right there just as scrappy as we are 
And without Jerry Allen, you would think that that number would have been drastically different. And that just wasn't the case. Even even with Cleveland, man, points in the paint, 42 to 30. Evan Mobley definitely had a way better game. So that was definitely a factor. But um, you, you think that with that missing piece of Jerry Allen, that this would have been this would have been a sure shot. But Cleveland came out shooting really, really good. Uh, Max Strus, I, I felt like every single shot that he threw out there, it, it fell and it looked like it was going in. And they obviously had a big lift from Marcus Morris as well, as well which was a little surprising. Um, and Gary Harris getting hurt, man, that was that was a big difference too because he's someone that we're relying on um, to guard Darius Garland to help out with Donovan Mitchell and um, him having that injury, you know, mid game kind of hurt a lot because. You know, our, our game plan kind of goes out the window. We had Jonathan Isaac a little bit on Darius Garland, and in my opinion, wasn't as effective um, as Gary Harris in, in terms of that position. So I don't know, man. It's 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 going to – I think that obviously we, we're, we're going to play better at home, but I would feel a lot better having Gary Harris back in the lineup. Hopefully he's able to go because even though he hasn't really contributed offensively, defensively he was at least someone that we can rely on so my question to you then is if Gary Harris is not able to go who do the magic now rely on to fill in in that starting position so I've been wondering the same thing all day I'm like what do the magic do here because if he cannot go I really don't think they'll throw Anthony Black in the starting lineup on a game six at home elimination game I don't think that's the right thing to do I also don't see Caleb Houston stepping up and being like, hey, go, go and play the shooting guard position again on a game six. I've been wondering, do we go massive? Especially if Jerry Allen ends up not playing. And by this, I mean, do you just put J.I. inside the lineup with Paolo, Wendell, Franz, and um, Jalen Suggs? That's kind of where I'm leaning towards. Um, they might have to reduce the, the rotation a little bit and, and go nine deep instead of 10 deep. That's where I'm leaning towards. What about you? What do you think they do if, if he cannot play? Yeah, I don't. I don't like the idea of Jonathan Isaac in the starting lineup. I think. I think we tried that, and it, mm -hmm. it didn't work out in our favor. You can. You can make the argument that you you're definitely putting your best five out there, but um, to me, Jonathan Isaac needs to stay in that second unit and and lead that team because I feel like our second unit has been extremely flat. Cole Anthony hasn't showed us anything. Um, Joe Ingles, like that that second unit. Mo Wagner, he's been on and off, like. Uh, Jonathan Isaac, at the very least, you're going to have somebody that can defensively hold us down. And I feel like if you take that out, then you're really hurting the second units. And yeah, maybe you can play Franz and Paolo Bancaro a little bit more. So you kind of stagger them out and make sure that they have a, a you know, we, we have one of our dual forwards in there. But um, I, I would rather you keep the second unit as is. And you have a couple different options, right? Um, you can go with Caleb Houston who has filled that role, you know, this season before. Caleb Houston is is a big body that that can go out there and and he's going to stretch the floor out because that dude is not afraid to shoot the basketball. My issue with him is his efficiency as as pretty as his jump shot is. You know, he he has struggled a little bit from behind the three-point line. He's still average, he's still a 35% and over three-point shooter, but um you you really don't know where you're gonna get from him in the playoffs. So playoffs is is a different animal. But I think Caleb Houston um, could be a good option. Um, another option would be Anthony Black. I don't think I agree with you. I don't think you take that risk to put him out there. But I would love to see Anthony Black just from a defensive perspective guard Darius Garland, guard Donovan Mitchell. Like I, I would love to see you know six foot eight Anthony Black out there just strictly focusing on defense and then whatever comes in comes in because at the very least he's good at driving to the basket and can dish it out you know if he's able to shoot the open shot then then do that um but in reality what i think will happen is i think you end up starting markel Fultz. i think coach moses is, is going to rely on uh markel Fultz as the veteran to start next to jalen suggs which is not ideal it's not not what hmm. would be my vote but i i can kind of see that happening yeah it wouldn't surprise me i wouldn't be a, a fan of it for sure just because again we, we need as many shooters as we can and even though gary harris hasn't been shooting it well at all 
he's a threat. So he demands attention. Suggs. Yeah, they demand attention. But if you put Markel out there, it's back to like, all right, we know he's not going to shoot it. Let's pack up the paint. And we do not want that. Um, before we move on from game five, let me ask you this. Paolo balled out. Paolo had an amazing game. Again, hit every shot imaginable out there. Phenomenal game. Two things about game five at the end. What were your thoughts on Paolo's execution the last maybe three minutes of the game? And second part of that question is, were you okay with the Magic not calling a timeout on the final possession that ended up on a shot, blo- uh, shot blocked attempt by France? Should mostly have called a, uh, called a timeout and kind of regrouped the team before the final possession, or were you okay with kind of free freelancing it and, and hoping for the best? I mean, to start off with Paulo, I think that you you rely so much on him this game and this series, and frankly, all season long that it did feel at times that we were just kind of giving him the ball and then everyone else was just kind of watching him work, you know. Um, the drawback with that is that the defense is, is collapsing on Paulo Bancaro, and there's really no saving grace. Like, he can dish it out, but, you know, Cleveland is, is, is hoping that we take the ball out of Paulo's hands, right? Um but he was he was he was making really tough shots, man, and and just he we got exactly what you expect out of Paolo, uh, out of Paolo Bancaro. Even the uh, the last two minute report came back and said that Paolo Bancaro on one of his final drives, um, you know he was he was he was fouled and should have went to the free throw line. And unfortunately, it you know it it didn't get called, didn't go our way, and you know it is what it is. In terms of Franz Wagner, um, I thought his his drive to the basket. I thought it was the right call by Franz. I, I really do. I think nine times out of ten, he makes that layup. I think it was a great defensive position um, possession from Evan Mobley. Um, it's unfortunate, but, you know, Franz got past his defender, one on, six foot ten, one-on-one with Evan Mobley. I'll, I'll take that. Take I, would rather, I would rather him do that every single time when the game is on the line instead of settling for... Uh, an inefficient three point shot, a mid range, like I, I don't, I don't want that. You can be, be, because the what it is is that you you drive to the basket. There's a higher risk of him getting fouled on that shot. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, we've seen Franz Wagner a million times this season making that exact same play over and over and over again. It's it's a high efficient shot for Franz Wagner. Um, so I I would live with it. I was not mad whatsoever that. You know that was a, <clears throat> that was a play that was drawn up. I was, I will say that I was a little surprised, a little surprised that Coach Most didn't call a timeout. Yeah, um, at the very least, you're able to get things settled. He he kind of let them go, but you know it, it goes to show you that Coach Most, you know he he trusts his guys. He they knew exactly what what the game plan was and who needed to get the ball, and you know that's what it, that's what it is. Now you can make the argument that. Paolo Bancaro, damn near 40-point game, game on the line. The ball should be in his hands. Live and die with Paolo. Um, Paolo is is a bona fide bucket getter. Why didn't Paolo get the ball? You know, it could be because that's what Cleveland was expecting. Who knows? I will say that if the plan was to drive to the basket, (coughs) excuse me, if the plan was to get to the basket, I would feel more comfortable with Franz getting to the basket, then Paolo trying to, he gets stopped, and then he settles for a mid-range. Or Paolo just doing whatever he can to get fouled and, and get to the free throw line. So uh wasn't mad with it. I understand the, the possession. Really great defense by Evan Mobley. It is what it is. You live to fight another day. What I will say is that the one thing I, I would add to that is Franz going to the hoop in that possession I wish he does it sometimes. He pump fakes before he goes for the layup. And I wish he would have done that because he would have caught Mobley in the air, potentially got him fouled, and maybe get the end one. So I just wish he would have stopped, pump faked, and then kind of gone, gone with the with the layup. But other than that, to your point, I like the execution of it. I wish again there was a timeout called. Um, but the one shot by Paolo that I, I really, really wish we could take back, 129 left in the game, I think it was in the fourth quarter. He took a 14 seconds in the shot clock three pointer that did not need to be taken. Why? We were down at one point at that time. 
I always look back at that possession and say, why did we take that shot? Like, I, I would have preferred a layup attempt. I would have preferred a drive to the hoop. Um, he was getting whatever he wanted closer to the hoop. You don't need to take a three-point shot in that possession down one. And then, of course, that that's kind of where we lost the game from there. But um, other than that, again, we could look back and, and analyze so many different things. I could even add that on Paulo's last three-point shot that he made uh, in the last seconds, he could have been fouled. There, there could have been a foul called in that, in that shot. That also wasn't called. But it, it is what it is, man. It was a missed opportunity, in my opinion. I think game five could have easily been a win for us. We got to look forward now and, and move past it. But um, the last thing I'll talk about in, in, regarding game five and the series in general, call Anthony. So we talked about him briefly a few seconds ago. Man, I'm looking at his stats right now, and I didn't realize he was this bad. Guess how many points per game he's averaging in the series? It's got to be like under five. You hit him on the head. 3.8 points per game. 1.4 assists. Shooting 10% from three-point range. 23% from the field. Meaning no layups. No, it's Nothing's going in for this guy right now. We need him, man. I need him to show up tomorrow and have a uh, tonight, have a big game. He is key to us, man, off the bench. He's got to score at least 10 points, game six, hopefully game seven as well. If he can help, that makes the game so much easier for Paolo and Franz. But it's so hard when our offensive weapon off the bench is not contributing. So I'm hoping that we see a better Cole Anthony tonight, man, because we definitely will need him. We rely so much on Cole and Anthony to to lead that second unit mm -hmm. because part of our strength all season long has been um, the level of play from our 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 second unit, and that's that's been Cole Anthony, that's been Jonathan Isaac, it's been Mo Wagner, um, and Cole Anthony. Man, I don't I don't I don't know what's going on, but it it scares me because we know what Cole Anthony is able to bring, but. Dude, this is a time, man. It's it's playoff basketball, and if you're not performing in playoff basketball when it matters most, and I get it, it's your first playoff series, but man, you gotta shake that off, man, because he's he's so crucial to the team. Like his his offense, we rely on it so much. The the eight minutes that Franz Wagner is in the game, the eight minutes that Paolo Bancaro is in the game, like we need that offensive factor. Um, to to hold us over, to help us get back, to um, keep Cleveland like on their toes and on their heels, and you know that that has been the case. Our our guard play has been subpar. It's been so bad. Like Donovan Mitchell and and Darius Garland, they're eating, man. They're they're doing whatever the hell they want. They're getting good looks. They're they're scoring the basketball. They're they're getting to the rim, and our guard play has been horrendous been terrible Jalen Suggs who has been an above 40 percent shooter all season long I, I don't have his stats in front of me right now in terms of of the playoff series on on his three-point shot but we haven't even seen it from Jalen Suggs either I'm not sure what type of voodoo happened to to our guard play but it's been it's been rough and if you at least get 50 percent of their production that we've seen all season long um, oh. it, it would have gone a long way. We we would have stole one um, from Cleveland in Cleveland, hundred percent. But we can't yeah. we can't do that without we can't rely on you know Paulo Bancaro to drop forty points every single game. Uh, Franz Wagner, we can't expect him to to deliver at Paulo's level every single game with Paulo. Like we 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 can't we can't do that. That's not that's not a good recipe for success and. Cole Anthony needs he needs to figure it out, man. This is the time that you do it now. Jalen Suggs, same thing. If Gary Harris is able to go, granted, Gary Harris was guy injured halfway through the game, but dude, nineteen nineteen minutes, zero point zero rebounds, zero assists. Like this has been like an a, a ever a never ending story with Gary Harris in this playoff series. Yeah, non non factor. Defensively, we see it. Thank you for what you've given to us defensively, but. Your offense, man, your 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 three point shooting, that's that's where we're relying you we're relying on you the most. And we we haven't seen it. Yeah, no, you talk about the guard play, and that's been again a disappointment. Cole Anthony, we talked about it. Three point eight point per, points per game. Gary Harris, your starting shooting guard, three point eight points per game. Markel Foltz, you know, a key contributor off the bench, six point two points per game. And then Jalen Suggs, actually doing the best out of them all, fourteen points per game. But again, 
when you compare that to Cleveland, you compare that to most teams in the NBA today, that guard play, man, has to be focus number one for us heading into the offseason. We're not going to talk about that too much. We're not, we're not there yet. But it's got to be eye-opening for the for the team, eye-opening for the coaching staff, eye-opening for the front office. That, hey, man, we got to figure it out because you cannot, again, it's it's not the right thing to do for Paolo and Franz and J.I. and Jalen Suggs to not have a guy next to them that can hit a three-point shot here and there, that can help them out spread out the floor. Um, so hopefully game six will be better. I, I, am, I am confident that Cole Anthony will wake up and have a better game at home uh, in game six. But again, man, it, it's concerning to have three guards at the moment averaging less than seven points in the playoffs. So that just cannot happen. Yeah, it, it can. So hopefully we see a little bit more from them um, because they, their, their impact is just so crucial uh, for this basketball team. Now, when you take a look at game six, what do you feel needs to happen for the Magic to be able to take care of um, game six at home? Man, so it's got to start with the rebounding. You got to win that battle. Um, you got to take care of turnovers and limit them as much as possible. You got to make shots. At home, you've been able to do so so far in the series. You got to be able to do so in game six. Um, Cleveland will come for it, man. I don't think Cleveland wants to go to a game seven on Sunday. I don't think they want that pressure of going back home, having to win that game. So if you're coming home, you got to come out strong. You cannot have a deficit in the first quarter. And you got to go for it, man. I know we blew them out twice already, so it's unlikely that we'll blow them out a third time at home. But that's my hope that we do because we want to kind of have an easy game if we can win by double digits and really focus on Sunday as that game that we have to have to win. Um, but I, I do fear that Cleveland will come prepared. Um, but if it's up to me, rebounding, limiting turnovers, and you got to make shoot at least 35% from three-point range in this game to have a chance. Gary Harris listed questionable with the right hamstring strain. Uh, Jerry Allen, it was reported that um, he's going to travel with the team to Orlando. Um, and he's going to try and give it a go, but he's still listed questionable as well. Um, part of me really hopes that he does play because I feel like we're better prepared uh, mm -hmm. with him in the game. Um, Magic play better at home uh, from every single aspect. Our, our shooting is better. Our rebounding is better. Um, obviously uh, a lot of that has to do with home court advantage. You know, we, we've gone, you've gone to every single playoff game. I, um, I've, I've gone to, I went to game four. So, uh, being able to, to feel how Kia center really lights up during the playoffs, it definitely makes a huge difference. The magic just are way more comfortable at home. They've played, uh, one of the best basketball in the NBA protecting home court, um, and I, we, we go into game six with every single expectation that the Magic will win game six. If we lose game six, jaw dropped. Like, I would be absolutely shocked. Uh, you know, I, I, I just I don't see it happening. What I'm more worried about, and I, I, I know that I shouldn't be looking too far ahead because we do need to take care of game six first, is that game seven back in Cleveland just because for whatever reason – Dude, this isn't. These aren't. These aren't the Warriors. These aren't uh, the Suns. It, it, Mavericks. Like it's the Cleveland Cavaliers. Like they they got a good roster, talented. But it's the Cavs, man. There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to take care of them in Cleveland. At least one game, one game. Like losing four straight in Cleveland would be insane for me as well like if i if i were to put money in a wager there's no way i would have thought that we would have lost all four games in cleveland so i i think that we're due for a really good game in cleveland but we got to take care of game six first so um yeah. i'm predicting i am predicting maybe not a win by 40 win by 30 but i'm expecting a good double digit win against cleveland for game six so that's that's my hope too. That if we if we end up winning tonight, it is a double digit game. Again, we can celebrate in Orlando. We can have a. If you've been to a game so far in the playoffs, you know it's a party after the game ends. You know, exiting the the, the, the Kia Center, people are cheering, go Magic, and people are high fiving each other. It's a crazy, crazy uh, vibe at the arena right now. After games, during games. So if we win, I want to experience that once again, like the, that that happy, joyful moment. Um, 
for what could be our last game of the season at home. So I really wanted to feel like a like an easy win that we can enjoy. Now, I'll be honest, man. Game six scared me a little bit. Uh, I've been saying it all day in our group chats and stuff. I don't know what it is. I feel like game six, Cleveland will come prepared. So I hope that I'm wrong, that we win it. Because I do feel that if we win tomorrow, I keep saying tomorrow. It is today, today Friday. If we win tonight, we win the series. So I think this is the biggest game of the series for us. This is my reason why. We went from getting blown out in Cleveland the first two games to barely losing on Tuesday night. Yep. I feel like we'll have the the energy, we'll have the 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 mentality that hey, we can beat the team. We we've proven it. We can beat them at home. We almost beat them here last game. We can get this done. And that'll be that mindset heading into it. Um so I really 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 hope that we can pull it off tonight. We can win this game because I think if that happens, Sunday around 3:30 in the afternoon we'll be celebrating a win and planning for Boston. Game seven. I, I don't even know. Like as a as a fan, I don't even know if like my body can <laughs> can really handle that level of pressure for for us to be able to go into game seven. I don't I don't want to talk too much about game seven because we we need to make sure we take care of business at home. Mm-hmm. Um but I think that that sends a very strong message to any free agent, any player out there that's disgruntled with their team and and looking elsewhere because you can clearly see the Orlando Magic play and point at our holes right the the areas of weaknesses and how are you not a guard out there uh D'Angelo Russell Paul George uh, whoever right how are you not look at the Orlando Magic and say man if if they if I played for that team they could elevate so much more because this is what they're missing. And I think that all I ask for in this playoff series is no matter what, don't get swept, play competitive, and and show what show what you're about, man. This next game is huge because, damn it, this game is on ESPN, man. It's going to be our most watched Orlando Magic game all year long. Got the most eyes on you. You talk about wanting to get respect you talk about wanting to be a part of the national media and and get people to talk. Well, damn it, this is where you do it. This is where you prove it, right? If you can go out there and you stomp on them and you win by forty again, you know this. It, it's it, this is a sending a message game. Like you want Cleveland to feel the pressure. The Magic don't have pressure. We have literally nothing to lose. We're in a position that we're on the up and up, right? It, we've already exceeded expectations by even making it into the playoffs. So we don't have anything to lose. The, the The people that have the most pressure is Cleveland, is the Cavs, is Donovan Mitchell, is J.B. Bickerstaff, is Darius Garland, Evan Mobley. Like, these are the people that have the most amount of pressure. And I think that you, wanna, you want them to feel uneasy at home. Like, there is nothing, there's no worse feeling, I would imagine, in the NBA than losing Game 7 in a playoff series, in the first round, at home. Mm. Like, that that must be the biggest sting, stab to the heart that I can really think of. And, damn it, I want us to be the ones to do it. And I, and I, feel, I feel like we're there. I feel like we can get there. Especially when you tanked on purpose to face this team. You asked for it. You so, wanted it. That's why I'm the, the one thing we said a few episodes ago was we wanted the series to be competitive, which the first two games didn't look like it, but we've made it competitive now. You want to again prove to those free agents, those guys that maybe disgruntled that hey, this team is on the up and up. We we want to be a part of that culture, that that team going forward. And I think we've proven that. That's why, again, to me, tomorrow is really crucial because we need to not only win that game, we need to. But I really want the experience of a Game 7. Again, you want to win it, don't get me wrong. But even if you lose it in a close game in Game 7, dude, the experience that, that this guy's just gained in one year, going through all the ups, ups and downs during the season, making the playoffs on the final day of the season as a fifth seed, taking the Cavs to a Game 7 potentially, like that to me would be massive. So I really, really hope that we make that happen because, again, that would, I mean, next season... It's not here yet. Let's not talk about it. But the experience that we were gaining, man, it's going to be crucial for us going forward. Yeah. So speak, speaking of that, rumor mill, 
There was a report from ESPN stating that there are two teams that are paying very close attention to Paul George, the Orlando Magic, and the Philadelphia 76ers because both of them have the money to throw at him and have a need for a wing just like him, a veteran guy. Um, when it when it comes to free agency and, and looking at you know players that, that could be added to this team and, and improve our roster, at the very least, I just want to say no matter what you feel towards Paul George, no matter what you feel towards Clay Thompson, the fact that the Magic are now being mentioned frequently <laughs> is is amazing. Because at the very least, you you want the Magic front office to be in the conversation. Like you you want us to be um, in the running, at least have a conversation with Paul George on on why we think that he would be a great fit. And there's there's a lot of elements where when I think of Paul George. I think of man, there's no way that he would want to play here. It, it it doesn't make sense, right? When when you when you look at Orlando and Philadelphia, uh, like why would he choose Orlando over Philly when Philly has um, MVP in Joel Embiid? You have Tyrese Maxey that's playing great basketball. Um, you know he can easily play there in the Eastern Conference, and they they could do work. Um, now you obviously would imagine that, you know, he would have concerns with Joel Embiid and, and, you know, can he stay healthy a whole entire season? Like we, they, we saw that they almost missed it because of Joel Embiid and, and his injuries. Mm -hmm. um, Paul George on his podcast talks crazy positively when it comes to Franz Wagner and, and Paulo Bancaro. Uh, talking to a few people online, they, they talk about, well, Paul George is, is, is in a different space now he's he's 33 years old it's probably gonna be his last contract he's married has kids like orlando would be a good area for him to kind of settle down in terms from a family perspective um the great thing is i think that a player like joe ingles could kind of talk to that i'm not sure what the future holds for joe ingles um but i i, I would rely on somebody like him who's who is a veteran that can kind of uh, explain the situation in Orlando from a living perspective. I, I think that that would help. Um, but man, if you if you can add Paul George, six foot eight player that offensively, you know, th this isn't young Indiana Pacers Paul George. <clears throat> so I, obviously he's not. I don't see Paul George in his prime, but still somebody that can elevate this team in the Eastern Conference. You add. Six foot eight there, six foot ten Franz, six foot ten Paolo, six foot ten, you know, Wendell. Man, you're you're looking at a really, really scary lineup that I don't know, man, I, I would be willing to overpay crazy money for for Paul George. I would want to see it. And I think that if the magic were to be able to hit a, a home run and, and bring a player in like Paul George, the, the last who who's our last biggest free agent? That we sign, Rashard Lewis. It's got to be. I mean, no one else, it, right? it would be. It would be. Yeah, it would. It would be huge, man. I would really, really hope that the Magic bring out the red carpet, do whatever you need to do to convince Paul George that the state of Florida is where he needs to end his career, or at least the the back the back end of of his thirties. Florida, no state taxes. You don't want the, the blizzard code that you get in Philly. I, I can list a ton of reasons why Orlando would be a great spot over Philadelphia. So my question to you, Al, would be, one, do you think it's realistic, Paul George, considering Orlando? And two, would you want that? Because for me, I felt like the biggest need for the Magic would be a point guard. But if you bring... Paul George in, then you're you're basically saying uh you're you're gonna roll with Jalen Suggs as as your point guard. So what are what are your thoughts on that? I mean, if that were the case and Paul and you know you're thinking of Suggs your point guard now, I I'm actually okay with that simply because in my mind, Paolo and Franz will be the ball dominant forwards that that will create most of the offense for us going forward. So I'm okay with that. If you have a chance at getting Paul George, you really have to consider it. I mean, how many times can you get a guy that averages, you know, 20 points a night that comes with the experience that he has in, in the league, who's won big playoff games? I'm all for it. I just don't, to your point, I don't see him leaving L.A. for one. 
And if he does leave, that Orlando's where he comes. I would love for that to happen. I just don't know how realistic that is. Um, and my other concern will be his injury history. So I'm looking at his stats here. 48 games played in 2020, 54 in 21, 31 in 22, 56 in 23. And then this past season was the best yet with the Clippers, 74 games. So ideally, he's healthy. Ideally, he's contributing. But what if you get the Paul George that's only playing 31, 54 games, 48 games a season? Is that really what we need? We're paying him, you know, I don't know what, $50 million per season? So that would concern me. We would, we, we would have to break the bank for Paul George. 100%. That's what I'm saying. So let me ask you a quick question right back. Would you be willing to give him, you know, $50 million a season with that injury history that he has had in recent years with the Clippers? I mean, I think it's time for the Magic to swing big. The Magic, I, ho I hope we've been saving for the last decade because we haven't been spending money on nobody. <laughs> uh, the, it's, it's, time, it's time to spend money, man. I, I think that the Magic, now we, we, we got a taste of the playoffs. Now there's no, there's no developing, let's, let's wait and see. No, the, the time is now, man. You got a sophomore, Paolo Bancaro, that got you to the playoffs with the fifth seed in the NBA. Now, now we've... We've exceeded expectations. Next season, the expectation now is to make it to the second round. Like, that's that's the expectation. You guys created that, right? So, yeah, man, I, I wouldn't. I, it's, it's, not, it's not my money. <laughs> <laughs> Orlando Magic spend, right? Um, I, I think that there's certain elements that you, you do have to keep in mind, like Paolo Bancaro, Franz Wagner, Jalen Suggs. Like, these guys, they're... They're they're not going to be cheap either. So mm -hmm. um, obviously, it needs to be something that that makes sense. Um, I trust the front office to to make a good financial decision. They've they've shown throughout their whole entire tenure that they found ways to be creative and, and flexible with with their contract negotiation. Um, the contracts that they've been able to get to me still it's is is wizardry, right? <laughs> So I, I think that, you know, you, you would definitely have to spend money. But, you know, we've we've done this before with Richard Lewis where we, we had to overpay. You know, is would Paul George, you know, would, would he accept that? Who who knows? But at the very least, Magic got to be in that combo. Exactly. I agree with you. And same thing with Clay Thompson, right? If, if those are names that are willing to come here, you got to be in those meetings. You got to make those phone calls. You got to set up those lunch meetings, whatever it may be. And uh, be in that conversation. So I agree with you. It, it may or may not happen, but at the very least, you give yourself a chance to have that conversation with those type of players. Because again, the last time we had that chance was back 2007, 2008. Like it's been a long, long time. So you got to take advantage of it. You got to capitalize on it. And again, I trust the front office that they'll make the right decision. Yeah, I like, I like the rumor for Paul George way more than the rumor for Clay Thompson. Oh yeah, big time. Easily. Easily. So definitely an upgrade at the very least with the word on the street. So game six tonight at 7 p.m. Play the Cavs at home. And if we win game seven, and it's going to be absolutely huge, man. 100%. Can't wait. <laughs> it's going to it's going to be crazy, man. It's win or go home. Win or go home. Like now's the time to show up. I need everyone to be shooting above 40%. Yes. And hit all your free throws <laughs> and grab rebounds. And, you know, offensively for our guards, score more than five points. Anyways, that's a wrap for us. Appreciate everyone for listening. Catch you guys next week. For all the latest Magic news and updates, visit OrlandoMagicHQ.com. And follow us on Instagram at OrlandoMagicHQ and on Twitter at OMagicHQ. Also, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and subscribe and leave a five-star review on your favorite listening platform.